Let's shift a little bit from Mark chapter, or from Mark where we were at the end of chapter 9, starting in chapter 10. Tonight we're going to go to Colossians chapter 3. A little bit different, okay? Go to Colossians 3 this evening. Paul's talking to his to the Colossian church, and I'll jump to verse one and two and three over in chapter one before I go to chapter three, verse one. Just kind of listen to what Paul has to say. Paul says, "Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ." So I'm chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of the Lord God, and Timothy, our brother. To the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before the word of the truth of the gospel, or eternal hope. Paul opens up this little letter to the Colossians and he says, listen, he says, I'm thankful. I'm showing a love for the church. Saving faith comes from Christ. Our eternal hope is in what Christ has done and only what He has done. And our home is not here but our home is heavenly in verse 5. It's a heavenly home. And we get that assurance from the pure word of this text that we're reading here this evening. Now if you jump to Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are what? Above. Seek those things which are what? Heavenly. Seek the things which are heavenly. Seek the things which are not earthly, but seek the thing which is heavenly. Because the hope that the Lord God has given us is that there is for us reserved a place in heaven for us to spend eternity with the glorious Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Right? I mean, that's why we're here, isn't it? To come and worship Him. We, we move from our midweek schedule, if you will. And for some, it seems like fewer and fewer... But for some, the, this time is set apart to worship the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. To reflect on the fact that, that we have a, a reservation, right? In the heavenlies. There's a reservation one day. When the Lord calls us home, when we breathe our last breath, there's no need to cry over us. Though many will, I'm sure. But we will be immediately catapulted into what? The bosom of our Redeemer. We'll be in His arms. And in then, He will tell us that we've been faithful to the calling. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Paul says, listen. Your spiritual affection should be for things that are above. Should be for things that are Christ. Should be for Him. But it's very easily done, isn't it, as a, as a human being living on this earth. It doesn't take much to where our spiritual affection is not for Christ. It's not for things above. We forget that we have a reservation in the heavenly, with the Lord of Lords, with the King of Kings, with the one who's created the heaven and the earth. And before you know it, 
Our focus is on who? Self, right? Our focus is on what? Earthly things, right? Things of this earth. It's sad, but we see that all around us, don't we, today? More and more things have come in and preoccupied the Christian. Forcing the Christian to, not they don't have to, but it seems like fighting the battle with the Christian more to where his or her mind is, is not focused on the heavenly, not focused on where Christ resides at the right hand of the Father, but focused on this world that is falling apart every second that passes by, isn't it? I mean, I don't have to remind you, we, we live in a falling apart world, don't we? You don't even have to watch the news to see that. And the interesting thing is, the world is falling apart so rapidly before us that, it, and, and so openly before us, that now man is parading his fallenness, his falling apart right before our eyes, lying right before us, and it's like it's no big deal anymore, is it? Well, here we're told that, listen, don't worry about this world. The world's going to go the way the world's going to go. But it's for you and I to set our minds on Him, Christ. It's easy to set your mind. When you think about your physical body, okay, from a, from a little child, you're programmed to what? To be concerned for this body. There's nothing wrong with that to a degree. But it seems like anymore there's such a drive for man to preserve this body. I mean, I just read something a couple days ago in, in, on the news that, that was posted, talked about the drive to eliminate death from mankind to where man just lives forever and ever and ever and ever. And that's... It's foolishness to us who believe in the glory of Christ because we know all men must die and all men will die due to the sin of mankind. But you see how mankind is, don't you? This drive to preserve the human fallen body. Exactly. And that's what it is, isn't it? The ambition to set your mind on Christ. And when you hear stories like that, that Justin just mentioned, for most people, they're kind of like, wow, that's, that's, that's different. It's, and the reason why it's different is because to see somebody with that holy ambition, to see somebody with that desire to follow Christ at all costs is rare, isn't it? It's rare. 
Especially in our day and time of Christianity where everything's so self-righteous, where everything's so self-absorbed, even in the Christian church when everything's about mankind. When you hear somebody who's sold out for Christ, who's, who's set their mind on things of Christ, on the heavenly, where Christ sits at the right hand of God that you see in chapter 3 verse 1, when you hear somebody that gets that, applies that, it's a rare deal. And they are looked at as if they got two heads. Aren't they? Paul to the Colossians was training them, getting them to see. Listen, Colossians, this is not about you, but this is about him. If you are risen with Christ, then seek those things which are from above. Since you've been raised to a new life in Christ, then seek those things which are above. Seek the reality of heaven. Seek the reality of He who sits at the right hand of the Father. Seek Him. Train your mind to seek Him. We looked a little bit about, we talked a little bit about that last Sunday in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Renewing your mind, training your mind, programming your mind, right? Training yourself to think on the things of Christ. Why do you have to train yourself to think on the things of Christ? Because your natural inclination is what? To go against the things of Christ. You naturally, in your flesh, do not want to follow Christ. That's the beauty about the Spirit of God. One of the beauties about the Spirit of the Lord Jesus when He comes to live in, to, inside of you Now you no longer are sold out for the things of this world, but now there's a desire in you for the things of Christ. And now the war starts, the Romans chapter 7 war. We even looked at that last week. That starts in you. And it's the battle. Paul says, listen, you've been risen with Christ, so seek those things which are above. Seek the heavenly. Try not to cultivate an earthly mind. And that's difficult, isn't it? It's very difficult. I mean, Tina, a couple weeks ago when we went to New Jersey, they took us to, there's two boardwalks up in South Jersey, one in Wildwood and one in Ocean City. And the Wildwood's the massive boardwalk, okay, and Ocean City's smaller, not as big, but still big. And when we went there, and me and Tina talked about it, just such an earthly thing. I mean, huh? It was just, it's good to see. You see it, but, but, you, but you see the drive for people as they seek to please themselves. And it's just an overarching drive, an earthly drive to please man. And as I was walking through there, I couldn't help but think many times, this is nothing. This is all they've got. This is it. But that's the earthly drive, isn't it? Like I said, there's nothing going wrong with going and enjoying it. But be careful that the things of this world don't control you. Be careful that the world doesn't control you. That's what Paul's reminding the Colossians. Be careful that the entertainment even of this day and time doesn't control you. Be careful that the things around you, and even in this day and time, 2,000 years ago, doesn't control you. And today doesn't control you now. Learn to focus on the, on the place where Christ sits on, at the right hand of God. 
That's where your ambition should be. That's where your drive should be. Focusing on Him. To please Him. So one day when He calls you home, me home, well done. Well done. My good and faithful servant. You did well. You did well. I mean, nobody wants, humanly speaking, nobody wants to hear the boss say, you did a horrible job today at work. I mean, you shouldn't. Now, times that by whatever, you as a believer, you should want to be pleasing to your heavenly Father. You should want to set your affection on things above and not on things on this earth. You should want to exalt Christ. You should want to have a spiritual mind. Not be worldly. But learning to set your affection on Him. On Him. Like I said before, this is... This is an odd person, especially in today's day and time. A man or woman or even a child whose affection is set on the things of Christ. Paul to the Colossians, getting them to see, getting them to understand that the affection must be on Christ. It must be. And him and him alone. A spiritual mind, if you will. A spiritual mind. One that's so programmed, not by the things of this world, not by self, but one, a mind that's so programmed by the Spirit of God. That even at work, their mind is on the things of Christ. Even at work, even when you're preoccupied at work, or even in pleasure, there's still times it comes in where you think on Him. You think of Him. You think of what it would be like to please Him more. To serve Him more. I mean, I've said it not a gazillion times. I don't even think that's a word. But we've talked about it numerous times in the past. Your reflection... On how much you love the Lord Jesus Christ. A portion of that will be shown in your worship. In your corporate worship. The writer of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25. Commands us. Does he not? To come together corporately. He's a body of believers. Whether it's on a Sunday, or Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. To come together corporately. And to worship Christ. To worship Him. Your affection means literally your mind. Your mind. To set your mind on Him. To program your mind on Him. Not so much on things of this earth. It doesn't take long before things of this earth strip you of your heavenly affection. Does it? Don't take long at all. It strips you of your heavenly affection. It strips you of the glory of Christ. It strips you of Him. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in who? In God. In other words, you've died to this life. Now your real life is hidden in Christ. For God. With God. 
But the problem is, in today's Christianity, it's always been, but it's so prominent today, is that Christians today don't see themselves as being dead to this human life. They see themselves as being very much alive. So much alive, they treat it Christ, they treat Jesus as some sort of father to where there's a divorce and you know they give him a little bit of time and they give themselves a little bit of time, they give the world a little bit of time. But no, that's that's not how it works, is it? Paul's saying no. You don't give like that. You don't worship like that. He's saying this. You give Christ ultimate time. You give Him preeminence in your life. They say, well, what about work? What about this? What about that? There's, you still can work. But there's ways to where you give him preeminence, even at work. Whether you eat or drink, or yes. whatever you do, whatever you do includes whatever you do. Yes. The yes. ultimate glory you got. You know, whether it's yes. laying brick or counseling patients or doing math homework or whatever it is. It's yes. do it all to the glory you got. Yes. It's a heart attitude heart attitude. Yes. 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 Well, verse 4 says, it says, when Christ, who is our life. It's not yeah. just a part of our life. Yeah. Not just, you know, a portion of it, not just Sunday morning, not just Wednesday night. Christ yeah. is our life. Yeah. So true, isn't it? When Christ, who is our life, He's our everything. Like Tina said, it's your heart attitude. Like I said before, just a few minutes ago, the believer that lives his or her life like this, like Christ is their life, they will be looked at strange because that does not fit in modern theology today. Does it? No. doesn't fit. Like a round ball trying to go into a square hole, it's not going to fit. Try convincing mainstream Christianity that Christ has to be your life. But that's the command, isn't it? That's the command. When Christ who is our life shall appear. You only believe the way you believe because He's given you the ability to believe that way. And now He is your life. And that's what Paul's telling the Colossians. He's saying, listen, this isn't up for debate. He is your life. Yes. 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 Exactly. Exactly.
Yes. Striving for a temporary world in a temporary body when life is so very brief. As James said, your life is but a what? It's but a vapor. That's all it is. It's but a vapor. A few of you who are older than me can attest to the vapor of life. Did you ever think you would see the age where you're at today? And I mean, you look back and you can't believe this time has passed by so quickly. It is just that. It is just a vapor. It's brief. It's what you do in that life that matters. For in Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Paul says, Christ is my life. It's my everything. He's everything to me. I am who I am because of Him, Paul says. I would be nothing if it wasn't for Him, Paul says. wasn't for him I would be nothing if it wasn't for Christ Paul on the road Saul on the road to Damascus I should say would have made his way to Damascus and carried out the task You can look back on your own life and you can reflect on it before you come to salvation. Some of us here have lived lives, you know, didn't come to salvation until later on or in our 20s or 30s or whatever it is or 40s or 50s, I don't know. But you, you understand that you look back and, and how you were saved from that life when you should have perished numerous times over and over and over and over again. You should have done perish and been cast into a godless hell. But by His grace and mercy, you were kept from that and awakened on that appointed day and brought to the Father to believe nothing of you, all of Him. I think what happens to a lot of believers is they lose the thrill of their salvation. They lose the thrill. If they're not careful, the joy becomes watered down. It's if they're not careful. The spiritual joy, the spiritual happiness is no longer there. And how does that happen? That happens very easy. Quit praying. Quit corporate worshiping. Quit showing a concern for other believers. Quit reading your Bible. And it doesn't take long, does it? To where your mind will start to not, your mind will start to set its affection not on heavenly things, but your mind will start setting its affection on what? Earthly things. It doesn't take long, guys. It really doesn't. It'll become earthly. Worldly. And day will lead into day, and month into month, and before you know it, it's year into year, and you're four, five, ten years down the road, and you're, and you're no spiritually farther along spiritually than you were five years prior. Listen, show me a believer, show me one who truly believes that's no 
no farther along spiritually five years down the road than what they are today. And I will show you somebody whose mind is not set on Christ. Guarantee you that. You say, well, no, no, it's true. Yes, it is true. Because a mind set on Christ will grow in Christ. Right? A mind not set on Christ will not grow in Christ. When I see a believer over and over again, and they're very ignorant to the things of Christ, they're very ignorant to, to, to the Word, and, and they truly believe, I say to myself, that is somebody whose mind has not been set on Christ. They might have truly come to faith, but their mind is not set on Him. Their mind has been set on the world. And they sprinkled it with a little bit of Christ. Satan has lost them, but Satan knows, ah, I'll just let them sprinkle with a little bit of Jesus and that'll make them content. That'll keep them thinking everything's okay. You are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. You're dead to sin. You're dead to this life. Your life now needs to be for who? The one who gave you the spiritual life in the first place. The one who gave you the physical life in the first place. Christ. Jesus. When Christ, Jesus, who is our life, as Justin said, shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. This is the reward that awaits you as a believer. You have an award awaiting you for being His child. You have that award awaiting you. You have the presence of Him awaiting you. Listen, the lost have no such award. Does the lost have the presence of Christ awaiting him? Oh yeah, the lost is gift. If you want to get technical, they've got the presence, all right, but the presence of his judgment. Of his judgment. But the presence we have is the presence of, of his glory, right? To worship him forever. To magnify him. To willingly glorify him. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3 verse 5 Therefore mortify your members which are upon the earth mortify them he says which is what put to death put to death put what to death Put to death the things. Yeah, I think every time I stand in that pulpit, I use the John Owen quote, be killing sin or it'll be killing you. And, I mean, that's where he yes. gets that principle from. Yes. He gives the list right here in verse 5 of just a sampling of those fruit of the flesh, fruit of sin. And a lot of people throughout the years misinterpreted that where it says to mortify your members. They felt like it was the Gnostics which half of the New Testament epistles fight against and they'd say oh the flesh is bad the spirit is good. The flesh is bad the spirit is good. No we are one creature. We are one being. You know the, the monastic movement it was deny the flesh, deny the flesh, deny the flesh. You know Luther sleeping on cold floors thinking that would somehow sanctify him. Nearly killing himself by sleeping without a blanket. An ad popped up for me online the other day for something about for the truly holy self-flagellation kids. It was, it was a whip to beat yourself because yeah. they still think the flesh the body is evil. There's a difference in the body and the flesh talking theologically. 
and you know it's it's caused a lot of confusion for people throughout the ages. Mm -hmm. People still try to beat their body, yeah, because they, they think the body's the evil part. No, your heart's what's the evil. Yeah, and it's only made new by Christ. Yeah, yeah, and that's why it's it's when you talk about set your affection in the King James. Paul's saying setting your mind. It's the controlling of your mind, right? The renewing of your mind. And that's where the battle is, isn't it? It's in the mind. The battle's won, the battle's lost. In the mind. It's won and lost. Where it's won, it's where it's lost. Paul says, Mortify or put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Which members? As Justin's saying, is it parts of your body? You beat yourself into some form of physical subjection? No. Put to death. The sinful desires that you battle with. Put that to death. That's only put to death when your mind is so set on Christ that it has no way in. Right? Show me somebody with their mind so set on Christ, sin has no way in. Does it? It has no door to come through. It has no door to enter through. Because the mind is so set on Christ. It's so set on Jesus. And no matter how much the demons of hell beat at the door, their mind is so set on Him. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, the fornication, and cleanness, and order and affection, and evil evilness, covetousness, and idolatry cover so many lusts of the flesh, so many evil passions, so much ungodliness, so much impurity, so much fornication is covered just in one verse, verse 5. Verse 5. Why, Paul? Why the hard lesson on setting your mind on Christ? Because Paul understood, did he not, the Christian walk. And if you look at his writings, all it is, over and over again, is a repeating of pretty much the same thing. Over and over and over again. Thirteen letters. Thirteen times of repeating over and over again. Every now and then you'll have pockets of different stuff. But how many times has he said, but just wordedly different, to set your mind on Jesus. Get your mind on Jesus. A constant repetition of that. Why? Because that is what we've got to be reminded about daily. Do we not? We have to be. You're exactly right. You know, it, it's like a pervert. If you think it, unfortunately, you're going to act. Yes. Yes. Yep. So he, he's keyed right on the button. He's, yep. he's, and then after you act on it, 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 it's a time before what you acted on is not enough anymore. Listen to a sociologist probably about a year ago, and he was talking about that very thing. 
Christian sociologist, and he was saying, you know, when, you, when you're thinking on something, you finally act on it. He said, eventually, what you acted on it just doesn't please you anymore. And then you act on something else similar to what you acted on in the first place to appease you, and then it's just, it just snowballs out of control. Well, that's about that kind of confidence. Wicked, craving, sensualness beyond natural expression. Yeah. So it and there's where Satan loves to have you because he's going to play with you yeah. if you like uh, toad frogs he's going to get you big ones what, whatever your little wicked he's going to feed you and feed you and you're going to yeah. act on it. Yeah. Yeah. it's talking of a sexual desire so deep so wicked Paul knew he understood that. They've traced back pornography in our own nation to the 60s and the early 70s and the Playboy movement and, they, and, they, and they've traced it back accurately and they said this is how we've ended up where we are today with so much sexual perversion in the nation in which we live. Adults with children and animals and on and on and on. Just, it's just wicked. But you see it being mentioned here. Nothing new under the sun. Just a different way to put it out there. He says, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Paul says, Listen. Because of such sin, because of such sin that I've mentioned, the wrath of God will come. It'll come. And when it comes, if man does not have Christ, Jesus standing beside him or her as their advocate, they are left to defend themselves. And you left to defend yourself against a holy God, you, you will not stand even one second. You will have no argument. There's nothing to lean on. There's no one to lean on. You can but, 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 but your whole life, but it still does not change. You can blame it on your parents and there's no excuse. So well put. You're hidden Christ. As Justin said, if you are not hidden Christ, then the judgment would come down upon you. The beauty of the cross being expressed right there. All what he's done for you. That's why at times it's, I must admit, it can be upsetting sometimes. When you stand behind the pulpit and you teach and you teach and you teach the truth of God and you notice some sitting out there and they're, they might as well just stay at home. No interest. Whether they're saved or not, they've, they've sucked themselves into the world. And their affections are now on the things of the world. And their desires for the worship of Him is minimal. It's sad. 
as Bob said, Paul, as he desired to believers to see, you do not want to go down the way of the law because you will never keep it. As Justin said, you must hide yourself in Christ. You must call upon Him so He can hide yourself in Himself, in Him. So look at your heart this evening. Look at your mind. As Tina said before, it's a heart thing. To train yourself up for Him. For the things of Christ. To train yourself up for His glory. For who He is. To train yourself up to serve Him and serve Him well. Don't be that one. Like we've said in the past, that all he or she can say is, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. Don't be that one. Be the one that is, his or her life closes physically. That they lay back in bed and on their head on the pillow and say, I've, I did, I did, I did. Maybe not perfectly, maybe not all the time, but I did. I served him. And I hope I served him well. All to the Colossians and we'll close. He's saying, listen, you're young in your faith. Set your affection on where Christ resides at the right hand of the Father. Set your affection on Him. Now, as we pray and as we walk out this door this evening, I guarantee you by the time you make it home, you will have 10 or 20 things completely opposite direction of the things of Christ pulling at you. Just a reality. They can pull and tug. But as was mentioned before, in all you do, do it for the glory of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we, we love you and we thank you this evening, Lord, to, for bringing us together as we look upon your truth, as we look upon your word, and to set our minds and our hearts on you. Through the power of your spirit, we can, Lord, and to train ourselves, our minds and hearts on you and your glory. We thank you. We thank you for those whom you sent here this evening, Lord, and we just continue to pray for the Wednesday nights that you be glorified, that you be honored, that you're magnified. Thank you for all that you do. Bring us back here again Sunday to once again look upon your word, your truth, to worship you corporately for your glory. In your name we do pray. Amen.